we're going to talk about today, I'm calling it the three bowls of Japanese culture. So it's going to be a little different maybe than the talks you're more used to, kind of a, a special thing. We're going to talk about some ways of looking at Japanese culture, thinking about Japanese culture, and from that hopefully we'll be able to get some new insights for ministry. But the very first thing we're going to do is you're going to get to know your table family a little bit. So three, two, five or six people, little groups. This is what I want you to do. I want you to, we're not going to introduce everybody in the room because that takes too long, but introduce yourself in your little table group. And I want you to give something like your name, home country, church, one other thing or something that you think is interesting. And I want you in your group to share things that baffle you about Japanese culture. And if you can, if you're bold enough, pick a little name for your group, whatever you want to call yourselves, colors, animals, whatever, I don't care. Just something fun. And then what we're going to do in five minutes, one person from your group will get up and will share with everybody the thing that baffles you about Japanese culture. Okay? And if you have nothing that baffles you about Japanese culture, you're in the wrong place because you should be down with Onishi Sensei. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right. You got five minutes to figure out is there something that baffles you about culture and get to know each other in your little group. So if you were sitting with one or two people, turn around and join the people behind you. Or invite somebody over or move your chair if you have to. Uh, who would like to go first? Which group wants to go first? All right, please. Our group name is uh, Purple Hair. Purple Hair, all right. Great group name. Well, we have one funny one is many grounded purple hair. Uh-huh. And then one not funny one is just when um, sometimes uh, married couples after children have uh, happy and they just not that much lover and more mother and father. Ah, okay. So which one is the one that baffles you? Both of those. Oh, okay. Yeah. Two. You want two. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> purple hair group. Yeah. Murtazaki no okay. Next group. Do we just go right here in the middle? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, we call ourselves uh, Every Nation. Okay. okay um, Every Nation. Isn't that a great name? You got people from all over. A hmm? yeah. um, couple of things that, that we were discussing. Mm -hmm. um, how the Japanese always pay attention to small, small, small details. Oh, small details. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the last one is uh, if you're gonna have a word that sums up the Japanese way of Japanese is the word consideration. Consideration. Yeah. Okay. So the baffling part is the attention to detail and why they have that? Yeah. And the consideration both? Yeah. Everybody wants two of them, I see. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And our last group, who are you guys? Not the most imaginative, but okay. it'll work. There. <laughs> so we're going to follow suit. We're going to have two also. So more of the serious one is the Uchi Soto. And so the idea if if you're in a group of Japanese, you don't know if you're in or out, and so that's kind of confusing, sometimes baffling ah, for okay. Westerners. And then uh, the more funny one is the jingles at the store. They're just loud, and they're over and over and over and over and over again. So that's kind of baffling. Okay, all right, hey, thanks. Give a hand for this group. <laughs> Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Uh, I don't know whether we'll answer your questions in this session or not, but I'm hoping maybe you'll get some ideas or insights in about at least some of these questions. Uh, some of them are a little bit different. I don't know about some of them, but we'll see. Now, the first thing I want to make absolutely clear at the beginning of this is I love Japan. I love the East. I love the West. I love cultures all over the world, North and South, and I love all of you. Okay? I want to get that clear so that if I say something that sort of touches the wrong spot, Please don't be offended. I'm just trying to help 
And if, if I got it all wrong, just ignore it and go on. And I'm going to speak in quite a few generalities. And I always hate it when people say things like, oh, the Americans are like this, the Japanese are like this, because everybody's an individual and everybody's different. And I always say, I'm not like that when they talk about the Japanese or the Americans or any nation. I'm kind of halfway here and halfway there and a little confused, okay? But uh, there are some trends, you know, about how people are, and these things that baffle you are sort of trends, you know? The, there's a lot of Japanese who are extremely detail-oriented and extremely considerate, for example, going with every nation group here. But not every Japanese is that way. There are some really big picture Ozapa Japanese too. So, uh, and you may have, if you've been here a while, actually have met a rude Japanese. They're kind of rare, but it does happen because everybody's an individual. And sometimes they have a really good reason for that. You know, they've been really hurt or something. Okay, let's roll along. Okay, uh, the seasons come, the seasons go. It's getting into fall. What kind of noodles do you eat in the fall? You know, we're gonna talk about noodles for just a moment. Okay, that may seem like a small item, but it actually is something we're just going to use it as a tool for some insight. Udon, soba, ramen. How do you decide which one to eat when you go out for noodles? You know, who has a favorite noodle? Who is, thinks udon is the best? Udon is the best. Okay, a couple of people. Who thinks soba is the best? Soba is the best. Soba's winning, soba's winning. Who thinks ramen is the best? Oh, I think ramen has it. I think ramen has it. I'm voting with ramen right here. Okay? I like them all. I like ramen the best, and then Nick's soda, soba, and then last is kind of udon. But udon's okay. It's kind of the uh, wonder bread of noodles, you know. If you had wonder bread when you were a kid, it's kind of what it's like, you know. <laughs> really kind of plain and white and never mind. At any rate, but, you know... How do you decide which one to eat on any day? Is there anybody that has not tried all three of these? Anybody that has not eaten one of these? Everybody's eaten ramen. Everybody's eaten soba. Everybody's eaten udon. Yeah, you're nodding your heads. Everybody's tried them all. So we all eat them all, but we have, most of us have a favorite, which one we like the best. And which one we go out to eat depends on different things. Now, if you're Japanese, some of the things you might think about is, well, what am I in the mood for? That's the same as maybe a lot of Westerners might think or something. Just what sounds good at the moment. But another thing is, you know, what's the season? Certain noodles are much more popular in certain seasons, if you observe. Now, they're all available year-round. People eat them year-round. But there, there's a rush on certain kinds at certain times of year or certain holidays and things. And you might have some other reasons for deciding, like... You know, some people think that soba is the healthiest of the three. And ramen is the worst for health of the three, many people think, because it's got the most oil, you know. But that also is a little bit debatable for various reasons, but we're not going to get that. Now, this is what I want you to get first off, and this seems odd, but in Japan, religion is like noodles. Does that sound odd? In Japan, for the average Japanese person, religion is like noodles. You probably have a favorite, but it depends on your mood, and it depends on the season. So what it's not about, it is not about what do I believe. Probably over 80% of Japanese never think very deeply about their religious beliefs or what they believe. So it's not about what you believe. In the States, it's very much, in the USA, it's very much about what you believe. Maybe in Africa, it's very much about what you believe. In Japan, that's not what it's about. There are people who are very passionate, who have very strong beliefs, and they're very concerned about what they believe, but they're the minority. Most people, it's not about what they believe, it's about what do I need? What do I need? And who might offer it to me? And what's going on in my life? Where am I in life? And is it our tradition? You know? Then they might ask, you know, well, how do I feel today? Do I feel like stopping by the shrine, or maybe the temple, or maybe the church, you know? What kind of mood am I in, you know? And then it's about what do I do? Because we already said it's not really about what you believe. When you go to a temple or a shrine, or for people who are not committed Christians, even a church, it's about what do I do to fit in with what's going on? What's the proper thing to do at this place and this time? So you go to the shrine, there's a little ritual of things you do. 
We're not going to go into those details now because it takes too long. But there's a little ritual. Depending on the type of shrine, the ritual might change a little. But every shrine has appropriate things you do and inappropriate things you should never do. And the same with temples. Depending on the sect of Buddhism, what you were supposed to do is different, although there's a lot of commonality. A lot of them have things the same, but there are also pretty major differences. You know, actually, this is something that if you talk about Buddhism in any depth, which we won't do today, one of the first things you discover is Buddhist beliefs are way wide and all over the map, okay? Take Christian faith. If you think about, you know, now left and right have no particular meaning here, okay? That's just directions. I don't want to use up and down because that would be worse. <laughs> if you think about Christian religions, and now we're going to talk for a moment about people who say they're Christian, so don't worry about it if they sound out there to you. We'll put uh, Mormons over there by that window. And we'll put um, ultra-conservative Amish over by that window. What they believe they have a lot more in common than two Buddhist groups chosen at random. Because the Buddhist group beliefs are much wider. Okay? They don't believe in the same Buddha. They don't read the same scriptures. They don't do the thing, same things. They don't believe the same things about salvation or enlightenment or what you should do on Tuesday. They're all over the map. But for most Japanese, they're not concerned about what the teaching of that group is. They're concerned about these other things, you know? Tradition, what's going on in my life? Location, is it convenient to go there? Or maybe it's not convenient and makes it fun to go to a spot that I have to hike up the mountain. You know, that's fun. And when I get there, what do I do? So you invite somebody to a Christian funeral who's never been to one in Japan, and the first thing they ask you is, what should I do when I get there? What's appropriate? What's inappropriate? We have our own expectations in the Christian church about what you're supposed to do or not do in church or at funerals or weddings. Uh, but we're pretty relaxed, a lot of us. You know, some groups are, are a little more exact. Now, talking about when is it or seasons, I think most of you are familiar with all these, but I just want to refresh our memory, so I'm going to run through them really quick. At the beginning of the year, you're supposed to visit a shrine, and some people visit a temple instead <coughs> for various reasons. But that's your New Year's first visit, and it's called Hatsumode. Over 90% of Japanese visit a shrine or a temple in the first five days of every year. Okay? Over 90% of them. I went around one year and I asked a lot of people, did you go to the shrine? It was about January 15th. And they told me where they went and stuff, or did you, some said I went to a temple instead. And of all the people I asked, there were only one person who said he did not visit a shrine. And he was a communist. And he was against all religion. Notice I included the Christians I know in that. The Christians I asked had all visited a shrine at New Year's. Okay? Now that doesn't mean they worshipped at the shrine. Maybe they just said, well, I went because my family went. But some of them may have worshipped, some of them may have not. But you got to do that. And then come February, it's time to throw some beans and people in Oni masks and yell, demons out, lucky in. You yell that because traditionally it's done at your home, right? And you open the front door and you chase the Oni out of the house throwing beans at them and say, demons out. And then you say, luck in, right? Get the luck into the house for the year. And then we have the Hinamatsuri, the doll displays, you know. Uh, how many ranks are there? There's seven ranks in a properly done doll display. You see some that are short. At the top row, what's up there at the top row? Anybody know? The yeah, the emperor. And then you go down to the emperor's retainers and the court musicians and on down the ranks to what's in the bottom row? The ox cart. Okay, the last two rows are things instead of people. A clear hierarchy is established in the doll display that keeps the imperial family in view every year to a lot of people and teaches them the emperor's on top and you go down the line and down there somewhere not even on the stand is you. Somewhere below the ox carts. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, maybe you shouldn't say it that way. But see, this is tradition and it reinforces certain beliefs. More than anything, it's probably Confucian there, but maybe a little Shintoism thrown in since we think the emperor is supposed to be, you know, kind of a god. We have the birth of Buddha. Uh, have you ever celebrated the birth of Buddha? 
maybe not but you know typically their flower festivals and stuff a lot of them that's what they're actually celebrating even though they may not say so is the buddha's birthday and uh, then you have the little flowers on top, a little stand, a little Buddha statue, and you go and you pour tea over the Buddha statue to celebrate the Buddha's birthday. I don't know whether the Buddha actually likes that or not, but that's what you do. Like I said, it's not about what you believe or things, it's about what you do. And what you do is you pour tea over the Buddha, okay, to celebrate his birthday. Try that on your friend. On their birthday, pour tea over them. See, see what they say. <laughs> okay, Ohanami, of course, is in there. It varies a little bit the dates each year. And then, of course, Children's Festival. Everybody loves Children's Festival. You know, you put carp up for mom, dad, and the sons traditionally, but now all the daughters got to get in there too and have their carp up and stuff. And this all has a tradition and a meaning. And then there's Tanabata, of course. And Tanabata has its own tradition and meaning of the two deities in the sky coming together once a year because they were separated and stuff. Not about what you believe, it's about what you do. And at Tanabata, what do you do? You make these little wish trees and you tie up your little tanzaku prayers that you write out and you tie them on the tree and that's what you do. And then Obono <laughs> comes and you have to do Bono Dori. And you have to visit your family's gravesite and clean it off and put out an offering and burn some incense and maybe hire a Buddhist monk to come and say a few words, chant. You know, Okyo is the Buddhist chanting. Hey, but like I said, depending on the sect, you get different... Uh, Sutras that they're chanting from. They're not chanting the same thing depending on the sect. Anybody know any of them? The, the titles of the things that the Buddhists chant? You know? Not even Daniel. Daniel knows lots of stuff like this. Okay, if, if we'll just give you two examples. Like all the Amida groups, you know, it's Namu Amida, Namu Amida. That's just the start, and then they go into a longer sutra. Or the Nichiren groups is Nam Yo Ho Denge Kyo, Nam Yo Ho Denge Kyo, you know? So what's that mean? You know, well, the first one is about glorifying of the Amida Buddha, and the second one is about the Lotus Sutra, and the Lotus Sutra is the top, you know, in that group. So you have them chant for you at Obon maybe, but also at the family Hojis and stuff. And if you're serious, you chant every day, if you're a serious Buddhist in any of these groups. And then we, of course, have Shichigosan. And then you dress the kids up in fancy kimonos and take them to the shrine and take their photo. And that's got its whole tradition as well. A uh, very nice tradition. Originally, it was the girls at seven years old and three years old and the boys at five years old. Now, lots of families take all the kids every year or they don't do it at all, a lot of them. You know, it's one of the ones that's kind of weaker now and not everybody has little kids. Oh, Misoka. New Year's. You ever hear the temple bells ring at midnight, you know, on New Year's, 108 strokes? What are they doing? They're counting the bonno, the worldly desires that keep you from getting enlightened. Loosely speaking, it looks like a list of sins. If you actually read their 108 list, you say, most of these are what we would call sins, but they call them worldly desires, and that's okay. They can call them something different. That's still what they are, but they're recognizing they're bad. So that's an opportunity to talk about sin in Japan, which you don't get very many opportunities to talk about. You know, Get out a list of them if you're brave and go down a list with a Japanese person instead of asking them in the Bible, have you committed any sins? Get that list of 108 out there. That's a longer list that we usually use and say, have you done any of these things? <laughs> when you need to talk to them about sin. You might try that. I've never literally done that, but I've alluded to it sometimes. And of course, you know, you got to have kohaku. You got to have the kohaku Utagasen, the battle of the red and white singing groups on NHK. Now, in addition to these annual events, and that's just a sampling, there's lots, lots more, but those are some of the biggest, most popular ones. Which one is most celebrated of those annual ones? We'll go back here a page. Which of these annual ones is the one the largest percentage of Japanese do? Hatsumode, New Year's Shrine Visit. Obon is number two statistically. Now, we don't know if this is actually the same because they, caught, they stopped keeping official statistics a few years ago. But the last time they counted, I think it was 94% of Japanese had done their shrine visit at the beginning of the year. In addition to those things, you have your daily home uh, routines. If you have a butsudan in the home, uh, maybe in the morning you chant a little bit and you put out offerings on it. In the evening you chant a little bit. Uh, you also have, you know, a kamidana in some, a god shelf in some homes, you know, and they got a little ritual they do for the gods there. Some homes have them both. 
And uh, I don't know how they decide. Which one do you do first? Do you do the Kamidana first or the Butsudan first, if you have them both? I've never been clear on that particular point. But there's a lot of little rituals. Now, a lot of homes say, oh, we're not religious, and they don't have either one. But somewhere in the extended family, there's probably at least a Butsudan. Kamidana aren't quite as common in the modern era here. They're easier to throw away. They're easier to throw away because they don't have the ehi, the name tablets, memorial name tablets for the deceased that go with the Butsudan. Because of those, it's very hard to throw away a Butsudan. Even if you don't want the Buddha statue or any of that other stuff, you got the, the memorial tablets with the death names of the people who died, and those are really, really hard for anybody to get rid of. Uh, you also have all the special events, you know, exams, illness, death, pregnancy, birth, decision, new car, new home, company, grave visit. All of these things have a ritual, and most of the rituals occur at a Shinto shrine or a Buddhist temple. So there's a lot of different things. And then there's all the local Matsuri festivals and stuff, and then the family hoji if you've got people who've died. How long did they do hoji for traditionally in Japan? Anybody know? Grandpa died. How, how many years do we continue doing the Hoji memorial services for Grandpa? 49 or 50. Exactly. 49 years or 50 years, depending on the way they count in which sect of Buddhism it is. Does everybody do that? No. Do a lot of people do it? Yes. A lot of people do it. Right? Why do they do that? They don't want to forget the people who've gone before. Okay? And, of course, whether you're happy, sad, or worried, you know, I've had people tell me, you know, every time I go to work, I drive by this one shrine, so I always stop and say a couple words and ask for a good work day. Or on the way home, if I'm feeling down, I stop at the temple and just sit a little bit, you know. And a lot of people don't go at all hardly anymore, except for New Year's and Obon. That's coming kind of to the Christmas and Easter of Japan, you know. Okay, we're jumping off to a different track for a moment. But remember all these ceremonies and activities and rituals and traditions. Put that in your brain and keep a hold of it. We're going to get back to it a little bit later. All right. Anybody recognize this painting? I could ask you what is it and what does it mean, but I already told you on the slide, right? I should have left that off the slide. This is Chinese. It's the Three Laughs at Tiger Brook. It's one of many paintings in this sort of genre. <clears throat> and what it depicts, it depicts a a Confucian person, a Taoist person, and a Buddhist person. And what they're doing is they, they're traveling together and they're talking and laughing and having so much fun with each other that they don't notice when they cross Tiger Brook, which is a place that's notorious for where the tigers come to drink and extremely dangerous and you should be really alert and looking out for tigers when you go there. But none of them even think about it because they're having so much fun talking to each other. So when they realize that what they've done, that they went through Tiger Brook without noticing, they're laughing, and they're all laughing uproariously. And what it depicts is the ideal harmonious relations between Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. And this is, I think, from 11th century Japan, uh, China, 11th century China, this particular one. But the idea is that even those belief sets are very diverse, they should be in complete harmony and agreement about the important things. In other words, what they believe is not important. It's their individuality, their personal relationships that's important. And this was called Sankyo Go Ichi, the three teachings in harmony, all right? So in old China and in old Japan, maybe Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, but fairly quickly in Japan it changed. So when people said Sankyo Go Ichi, three teachings in harmony, they meant Shinto, Buddhism, and Confucianism. How many of you have ever been to a Confucian shrine in Japan or seen one? Have you ever seen a shrine to Confucius in Japan? Maybe in photos. There's only two or three left in Japan. There's one in Okinawa and one up in Kanto. I don't think there's one anywhere in Kansai as far as I know. Uh, Confucian shrines are out. So in modern Japan, and here I mean the last hundred years almost, uh, it's really when they say this they mean Shinto, Buddhism, and the secular world. Only they don't say it anymore. I'm saying it. I think that in modern Japan you should consider the three teachings in harmony to be Shintoism, Buddhism, and secular Western humanism type of thinking, non-religious thinking. But you see, the idea that they should be in harmony is still very strong in Japan. Now, in my American childhood and background, I look at these guys over here talking about the whole universe came in by a random accident and all these things happened randomly and boom, here we are. 
And over here, look at the Bible, it says God created the world, you know what, etc. To me, these are so different that there's no way I can say they're in harmony. But to Japanese people, you're looking at the wrong things. You know, over here they say you should be a nice guy, and over here they say you should be a nice guy. So they're really the same. You know, they're really in harmony. No, they're not in harmony. But that's the way Japanese people want to see it, and the way a lot of them see it, is maintain that harmony, human relationships, that supersedes whatever the actual, quote, teachings are. This is where we say sometimes truth is not considered a core value in Japan. It's not that they don't care about truth, but it's not a core value. Honesty is a core value, but what they mean is not telling the truth, they mean not stealing. Okay? There's different kinds of honesty. We use the same word in English, you know. Speaking the truth is honest and not taking other people's things is honest. In Japan, usually when people talk about honesty, they mean don't take other people's things, basically, that kind of honesty. So here we are. Shintoism, Buddhism, and secular. Now we're back to the noodles and the bowls, right? Okay. Which of these three influences, which, no, I don't want to say it that way. Which of the influences on this slide is the greatest influence in Japanese culture? Anybody want to take a guess? I have an opinion. You may have a different opinion. That's okay. Yes? The secular, okay. Anybody else? Look at the slide carefully, that's a hint. The biggest influence is the bowl. The three bowls. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is Shintoism, Buddhism, and secular thinking all are formed into a particular shape, into a particular pattern that the bowl here represents, not literally a bowl, but a set pattern that they all have to fit into in order to maintain that harmony that we just said is so important, okay? The bowl is the most important part. It's the biggest influence because it overrides all three of them. This is my thinking. You won't find that anywhere else as far as I know, especially not using bowls as an illustration. So what does the bowl represent? Confucian influence, okay? Now, you will have a hard time finding a Japanese on the street who says that they're a Confucian person, right? Tough time. You might find one if you search long enough, but boy, it's not easy out there to find a con somebody who actually says they're Confucian. Nonetheless, my own experience, my own study of Japanese culture leads me to believe that everything that happens in Japan and the way it's conducted is influenced by a Confucianist worldview underneath. Not entirely, there's other elements in that worldview, but a big element is the Confucian influence. Confucianism officially stopped being important in Japan at least after World War II and to a large extent after the Meiji Restoration. Before that, you could have had a much easier time finding a Confucian person on the street and Confucian temples. But they went out of fashion. They went out of fashion after the uh, 1871 uh, emancipation proclamation that ended the caste system in Japan that was largely built out of Confucianism. They went out of fashion when Japan decided in the gear up to World War II to elevate Shintoism and emperor worship really, really high and to push everything else down. Christians were persecuted, but Buddhists were persecuted and Confucians were persecuted too if they were actually dedicated to that and didn't want to do Shinto things. So the, it was pushed down. But it's not gone, it's just hidden. It's the underlying shape of everything, okay? And you know, there's a lot of Confucian thinking and teaching we could look at, but what I want to focus on for a moment is uh, Ko, filial piety, Nin, or Jin, humaneness, and ritual, day. Uh, the kanji on the left is correct, but it's so out of date nobody uses it, so you can look at the one on the right for the ritual there. Now, filial piety influences all this dedication to parents and ancestors, okay? It's about, uh, you know, the term Oya Koko. It's, it's the good relationships, respecting your parents and taking care of them. That extends not only to parents, but on back to grandparents and ancestors. And it's what the Confucian people would call filial piety. They don't use that word in Japan. 
As a matter of fact, you'll rarely see these things used this way in Japan, because like I said, it's the bowl, it's the underlying shape. It's not what you see openly. Kindness, helpfulness, consideration, that's the humaneness part. That's a Confucian value. Traditions and ceremonies and maintaining them, that's ritual. What they mean is not a specific ritual, but the ritual, ceremonies, festivals, and everything that form that cycle of the year and stuff, that's day. Now you may know day from Degi, Degi Tarashi, you know, the person who's polite and considerate. Well, that's part of it too, but the original meaning in the Confucian sense is much deeper and much wider, okay? And then underneath that all is the idea that man is a social being. A lot of Confucian thinkers would actually question whether it's possible for an individual human to exist. Because everything that defies being human is based on relationships. They have what they call the five relationships. We won't go into that today, you can read it on your own. But everything is involved in relationship to others. So the most important thing for the average Japanese person still today is how you handle your relationships. They'll no longer use the Confucian term of the five relationships. But there's a defined pattern of how every relationship would, should work. Parent, child, teacher, student, boss, employee, sister, brother, you know, all these friends. There's a defined way that that's supposed to work. It's not spelled out explicitly, but it's an implicit understanding in Japanese culture what's right, what's wrong in every area. Confucian influence in Japan dates way back the uh, 604 AD, the first so-called constitution of Japan, the 17 article constitution that Shotoku Taishi uh, promulgated. He's also the founder of Shiten Noji Temple in downtown Osaka. He's the guy who gave the money for it, and he gave government money, not his personal money. That's the first temple in Japan, Buddhist temple in Japan, funded with government money. Shotoku Taishi, thank you. He gave us a bunch of money to build this big temple. It's still here today, 1,400 years later. And the first words of that 17 article constitution are harmony is to be valued and the avoidance of wanton opposition to be honored. Okay? Wanton opposition is opposition to the government or to any kind of authority or to parents or anything. Now if you look at the Confucian Analects, you'll find what's probably the source of that. It's reworded and reworked. But in the Analects, it says, when harmony prevails, there will be no scarcity of people, and when there is such a contented repose, there will be no rebellious upsettings. Okay? They look pretty similar, right? So, Shotoku Taishi, in writing the 17 Article Constitution, he starts with Confucius. Jukyo is the Confucianism, and Koshi is the Japanese, of course, for Confucius. Confucian influence continues from the 6th to the 10th century. There's Japanese law based directly on Confucianism with lots of quotes from Confucius, and it goes through several evolutions. We won't even get into that. Uh, Ditsurose is a good word to know for random history buffs. And then it goes on. In the Edo period, you have what's called Neo-Confucianism. Edo period, or we sometimes say the Tokugawa shogunate in English is a common way of saying it. But the Tokugawa Shogunate made a conscious decision to promulgate a new version of Confucianism to uh, reinforce their authority and why people could not oppose them and to build a caste system of this hierarchy and stuff. All of that is done and it reinforces control of the country and it's brought into their laws and things. In 1790, the Kansei Edict is promulgated, making Neo-Confucianism Japan's official ideology and making it illegal to teach anything that opposes Neo-Confucianism, okay? That's the period also in the Tokyo period when Christians were persecuted, but it wasn't just Christians, a lot of people were persecuted because they didn't agree. But Neo-Confucianism was basically the law of the land and Bushido, that many of people like to read about, is really born out of Neo-Confucianism. Neo-Confucianism or Shushigaku, it's usually called in Japan, uh, is a huge influence on Japan for two and a half centuries there, okay? Now we're gonna dip back into the Analects. I just wanna give you a little flavor for Confucian ideas here. The master said it is not easy to find a man who has learned for three years without becoming good, without coming to be good. And the master said, that's Confucius, right? With sincere faith, he unites the love of learning, holding firm to death, he is perfecting the excellence of his course. 
The idea underlying this in many of the analects of Confucius is that man is good, he's teachable, he's improvable, and he's perfectible. Not blind to the fact that men and women do a lot of lousy things. But inherently, the idea is that people are good if you give them opportunity and the ability, they will show that they are actually good at heart. That may conflict with something else you know. <laughs> uh, here's a summary from uh, Edward Craig in the Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Neo-Confucianism, the philosophy can be characterized as humanistic and rationalistic with the belief that the universe could be understood through human reason and that it was up to man to create a harmonious relationship between the universe and the individual. Wow, that sounds a lot like secular humanism, really. But it's not. It's Confucian. And uh, a lot of ideas in secular humanism are very opposed to Confucian ideals, uh, ideas. But th there's some things that are in common there. Interesting little one. Confucius said, what you do not wish upon yourself, do not impose on others. But Jesus said, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Right? Hey, I'm with Jesus. But Confucius is easier. What's the difference between these two statements in practical terms? Right. Exactly. One is active. Jesus wants us to actively go out and do good things to people. And Confucius just wants to make sure we don't do bad things. You can completely keep this rule of Confucius by doing absolutely nothing in every circumstance. Okay, here's a Confucian temple in Okinawa. Uh, no, Nagasaki, I'm sorry. I think this one's in Nagasaki. So there are a few of them left, but not many. Okay, Confucian values in modern Japan. Things I really notice is the emphasis on education and exams. This is very much what Confucius taught. Respect for parents, teachers, authorities. Confucius. Ceremonies for the ancestors. Now people say that's Buddhist and they put it in the Butsudan and the Buddhist temples, but that was a decision by the Tokugawa people to put it there. It's really this worship of ancestors, this respect for the ancestors is Confucian. It's not Buddhist originally. Now it's Buddhist in Japan, but originally it's not related to Buddhism at all. Buddhists didn't do that until the Confucianists told them they had to. Traditional festivals and ceremonies, community and harmony, gratitude, social courtesy, gifts, polite language, all of these are Confucian. Attention to detail and being very exacting to try to do it right is Confucian. What about the church? Is the Confucian church also in, is, I'm sorry, is the church also in the Confucian bowl? Sometimes traditional Japanese churches can be very much inside that Confucian bowl that they maintain the exact same things as a temple or a shrine in terms of these various ideas. Now, I spent six and a half years in this church. This is uh, Hiroshima Fukushima Chokyokai. It's uh, United Church, Church of Japan, United Church, Nihon Kudisto Kyodan in Hiroshima. And I was there as a sort of co cooperating evangelist with my wife. We were there working with Pastor Nagashima. Wonderful man of God. I love that guy. Wonderful man of God. But he was a maintainer of tradition. In some ways, it was a very Confucian church. Okay? Uh, this is me up here on the right side on your screen there, doing my very first Japanese sermon in Japan 20 years ago. Okay. So, and then we have some nice fun with the kids, you know, and different things. Uh, but it's a wonderful little church, but the church could not really grow or reach younger people very well, and some of the reasons were because of Confucian ideas, okay? Here's traditional Japanese church thinking. Church is like a ship. The priority is to keep the ship and all aboard safe. Space is limited. You can only take so many passengers on or you'll capsize the whole ship. Transfers to other ships require great caution. Okay? Success is defined as everyone that we baptize in this church is delivered safely to heaven. Protecting the people and taking care of the people that you have let aboard your little ship is high priority. That's success. What does this lead to? This leads to some very good things. This leads to great pastoral care. 
This leads to very long-term thinking that somebody enters that church and is baptized there. You can rely on that pastor to keep checking on you regularly for the rest of your life unless he dies first. Great pastoral care. Great commitment. But commitment to what? A lot of times it's actually to Confucian thinking, even though they would never say it that way. That doesn't mean they don't believe in Jesus and aren't saved. Yeah, they usually do believe in Jesus and are saved, but they're limited in their cultural way of understanding how to practice that. Now, Japanese people also sometimes object to this. I found this objection actually on a web blog. The address is there. And this objection says, Kyokai ga fune nara bokushi wa sencho de shinto wa jokyaku ka. I should be sticking to the English here. This is the English group. If the church is a ship and the pastor then, is he the captain and the believer just a passenger? Is that how it works? And this blog says, no. If the church is a ship, Jesus is the captain and the pastor and faithful or seamen, seekers and unbelievers are the passengers. Hey, that's better. But it's still a ship. It still has limited capacity. You can only bring so many people on and your priority is getting from where you let them on to the end destination, heaven. Get them there all the way safely. So the ship is actually a form of the Confucian bowl. Okay? Now, this is where I have to say, you know, some people would look at this and they would have very negative thoughts about Japanese church. Don't do that. There are a lot of really, really good things about this approach to church. Vastly better pastoral care than in almost any Western church is one of them. But what about the Western church? What is it like if you apply this kind of question to it? Okay, remember I said don't get offended. Western church thinking, church is business. Plan, invest, take risks, grow, space is unlimited. If you can, have a big church, do lots of evangelism, lots of disciples, and spin off daughter and sister churches all over the place and grow, grow, grow like Facebook. <laughs> Hopefully creating profit for the kingdom of God instead of just the church bank account, okay? Does this seem like you could see this in Western churches somehow? Some of you are from countries where I don't know how they do church, so okay. You gotta make up your own model. But each way of doing it has pluses and minuses. So uh, that says five minutes, you only get three because we're tight on time in your group. Try to think of what's good and what's not good. We're not doing bad, okay? No bad. Good and other about the ship model of church and the business model. Talk. Three minutes. Okay, time's up. Time's up. Okay. Now, we're not going to ask you to share about this right now. I just want to know, did everybody find some things that were good about the ship model? Did everybody find some things that were good about the business model? Was anybody horribly offended? <laughs> no, good, okay. <laughs> Brent in the back. Okay, that's okay, that's Brent. <laughs> Sorry, Brent, go me aside. <laughs> Life seasons oversimplified. Uh, a person starts out as a child, they grow to be a teen, young adult, college, midlife, older adult, elderly. Typical roles in these things is as a child, parents decide everything, as a teen's study dominates your lifestyle. You know, exams, exams, exams. Young adult college, you have great freedom. Okay? That's a typical pattern in Japan. Midlife, the demands from others increase, and there's lots of pressure to conform to Japanese norms. As you enter midlife, grandparents die, and they want you to maintain their Buddhist funeral rites. Parents want to make sure that you take over the household butsudan when they're gone. Everybody wants to make sure that you pay your dues to the temple. Maybe you're a member of the danka, the group that is the real supporters of the temple, et cetera, et cetera. You know, lots of pressure. The businesses want you to start taking over some of the ceremonies of the businesses. A lot of the older companies, every year they have a pilgrimage to the grave of the founder and they all bow. A lot of businesses have a Shinto shrine that they all go to and bow on certain times of the year. And whereas before you were just part of the crowd and you could kind of hide or maybe even make an excuse and not go, now they want you to start being in charge of that stuff. Older adult, you're responsible to uphold the Japanese and family traditions and begin to make sure everyone else does. And when you're elderly, you're dependent and you start to demand that others uphold tradition because you want them to do your memorial services after you die. You want to make sure that for 50 years after they die, they have the Buddhist priest down, Buddhist monk down to do little hoji ceremonies for you. 
challenges for the church. We all know the basic challenges of the church. I just want to highlight that if you're a child and you come to the church, the children in the church, how do you keep those children in Christian families from losing their faith as teenagers when all that pressure of education and secular pressure hits them? Okay? When the school starts to become a stronger influence than the church in their lives. Young adult in college, great freedom. A lot of the people who come to faith, some of you come from churches that are very successful at reaching young adults. But that's when they have freedom and nobody really cares very much if they dabble in Christianity. Although some families will object to actual baptism. But how do you keep them if they've believed in Jesus? How do you help them navigate those temptations and demands of midlife, older adult, and elderly life successfully? And returnees are a special category all their own. You know, this conference, Reaching Japanese for Christ, it originally came out of the U.S. desire to reach Japanese in the United States who were studying there uh, as students are working there uh, to reach out to those people, but then they come back to Japan, and some of them come back with a lot of Christian experience. And some of the ones that have a lot of Christian experience are highly dedicated, capable, committed believers who are ready to serve. And some of them were just doing the, when in Rome, you do what the Romans do. And I leave and I come back to Japan, I leave my Christianity behind. I didn't pack that in my luggage. So returnees are a great challenge. In addition to that, most of them are from that young adult group. So they come back and they get hit smack in the face with all the demands of Japanese society as they're expected to begin to transition into responsible adults and playtime is over. By the time you hit 30, if you're in a company, playtime is kind of over. It's time to roll up your sleeves and bow to the pressure to conform. And this is what happens to a lot of them. So this takes a lot of prayer and thought about how to work with those returnees people. It's a great opportunity, but it's also challenging. But Paul said, I have become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, there are different strategies for working with all these issues and these people. The church I was at in Hiroshima followed a lot of replacement strategy. And that's been done in missionary work across the centuries. They have Shichigo-san 75... 753 ceremonies at the shrine, we'll have our own ceremony on the same day at the church. And if people come in their kimonos and stuff, little kids will take beautiful pictures of them and stuff. Because the Japanese, most of them don't actually care about the Shinto or Buddhist content, all this stuff. They care about upholding tradition. And if the church makes it possible for them to uphold some of those traditions, it helps them. On All Saints Day, how many of you celebrate All Saints Day? Ah, uh, not many Catholics in the room, huh? <laughs> or Protestants who come from the fringe. But All Saints Day is a great way to replace Hoji. You know, at their church in Hiroshima on All Saints Sunday, uh, the pastor invited everybody to bring the big portraits in of their deceased relatives and to hang them on the sides of the church along the walls. And while we all ate udon, everybody would introduce their deceased relatives, and then we would all go to the gravesite for the church and remember the people who died in the church. You know, and it was all very Christian and stuff, but it was also kind of Confucian. But it kind of replaced some of the things that Japanese society expects. Okay, this is eight minutes, you get three minutes again, because we're a little tight on time and we're gonna cut into your break a little bit. Uh, real quick, talk to each other for three minutes and answer these three questions when we come back. Go. <laughs> Mrs. Time's up, guys. We want to leave time for you to share something. See here, we got. We actually have a little more time. For a moment, I thought we were supposed to end it too, but it's 2:15. I should know. I actually wrote the schedule, and I don't remember sometimes. <laughs> Just for a moment, I forgot. So we do have a little bit of time, but we have uses things we want to do still. So uh, last time we start over here. Can we start over here? Can somebody get up and uh, tell us something about? Things that were learned today, if anything, and did you find any answers, and do you think there's anything that needs to change in your ministry? Not you personally, but from your group. You don't have to identify whose it is or something, but. Uh, okay, so we kind of learned, uh, you know, the, the background of the belief system and the bowls helped us a lot, and then the, the idea about the ship is so 
you know, man, we can identify with that uh, the Western idea of church being totally different business model versus, you know, a ship mentality. And so that's uh, what we took away from that. And then, uh, yeah, the answers to the things that baffle us, that, that helps to kind of explain those. And then the things that we could change in our ministries is, you know, it's, it's the same kind of thing, but we just have a whole different host of uh, activities. So you got fall festival that's close to Halloween in the States. But here, you know, you, you, you try to find those uh, matsudis, the, the different uh, cycles of life, and say, here's, here's something that, you know, allows for celebration, tradition, the bowl, but also could be glorifying to Christ. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You were in the middle last time, so let's go all the way over here and come back. And mix it up a little bit. How about our group over here? What do you got for us? Daniel Yes, we're talking. Honestly, it was very fast, so it's Please difficult. Please stand up and so it projects so everybody can hear you. Please be bold, be strong. You can do it in the strength of the Lord. And <laughs> to be honest, we didn't get to talk because it was so, so small, but yeah. I think. Yeah, learnt stuff about um, Confucianism, and that was new to some people for how much it was a part of Japanese culture still. And um, in terms, also another interesting thing was the um, crossover between what he said, the Matsuri, and then also some kind of Christian redemptive okay. holiday. And anything else, my friends? I have this thing, I just get to the bottom of my back because they die. I talked about a little bit how almost hearing about the New Saints Day and how like using it as an opportunity to like let's look at our ancestors and like go to the church site or the grave site together. Like personally I felt almost like discomfort with the idea of it because it was so f different from the way I have. Yeah, in the States you go on Memorial Day instead. <laughs> right? I don't know. Something about it was like, well, this is new to me, and I almost felt, like, uncomfortable, which is, I think, good for me to realize, like, hey, like, that's my Western point of view that's shaping the way that I'm assuming church should look like. Smart. Yeah. Well, if there's anything about being a missionary that you learn, it's that it gets your boundaries pushed. Okay? <laughs> You'll feel uncomfortable a lot. Yes, uh, middle group. Kind of dissolved, but who's left? <laughs> Everybody has fled. <laughs> um, we uh, talked about the. Uh, it was it was helpful to um, kind of hear that Japanese don't really care what they believe as much as they want to adhere to the ritual aspect of it. That was a little eye opening for some of us, and also um, we. Uh, we recognize the value in assimilating some of the traditional things that Japanese do and trying to offer something in the church, but at the same time feel like we should proceed with caution. No one contradicted that, but then because we definitely want to have a separate, you know, a call to come out and be separate from society. Mm -hmm. And so since we don't fully understand the traditions and how people think about them, felt like it's important to kind of move cautiously in that way as well. And uh, so, yeah, that was some of the things we took away. Yeah, there are definitely some things we want to be careful about, right? So, yeah, we didn't clap for you guys. Yeah, for both groups. Both groups. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, and there are some religious groups. We're, these are big generalities. Some religious groups in Japan really, really care about their teachings. Two of those groups would be Tendikyo and Soka Gakkai. Those are two a Buddhist group and a new religion group that really care about those teachings that they promote. Uh, but most groups in Japan, really, it's tradition and stuff. So let's see here. Questions for me. We do have time to take some questions from the floor. If you ask the right question, I'll make you more uncomfortable than you were so far. <laughs> so hardball questions are OK. Softball questions are also OK. Anything you want to ask? Wow, everybody's got it. No questions. Or everybody's so annoyed with me that they just not going to say anything. Okay, I need a volunteer. Okay. Okay, so like, um, I 
fun yeah. when I'm talking with Japanese people, like they don't, um, this is generally, but like they, they say they've never thought about eternal life or when I pose the question like, um, it doesn't matter to them or they don't want to know. Um, do you have any hints on how to, I don't know, go forward with that? Yeah, it's a good observation that they don't really want to know. Uh, actually, there are a whole lot of Japanese that when you come to them and say, I'll show you how to have eternal life, they think, oh no, I've got enough problems. Don't do that. I don't want to know. Don't tell me. That sounds horrible. A little different than an American reaction. America, they might not believe you, but the idea is kind of appealing. And it is for some Japanese too. Well, why? Because when you say eternal life, what they imagine is going on with the same suffering and difficulties and stuff that they have forever. Never getting out of all those relationships with people that stifle them, never getting to do what they really want because they go on and on and they got all this pressure on them and stuff. It sounds terrible to live forever. So we really have to, if we share about eternal life, we have to paint the picture, not of length of life, but abundance of life. You know, not of living on forever, but life being really truly joyful and only entering the relationships that you want and that you like. You can tell them later that you'll want and like having relationships with everybody in heaven. It won't be like you're ignoring that person that you don't like, because in heaven we'll all suddenly get along, is the way I understand the whole brothers and sisters in heaven thing. So uh, take the focus off a of length of life and onto the abundance of life. You know, Jesus promises abundant life. Focus on that. Focus on what is hard about this life and how Jesus and the gospel can both make it easier here and more blessed here in some ways, although sometimes persecution comes and it's harder here. But in heaven that we have a whole different kind of life. Does that help at all? Yeah, that's good. Okay, anybody else? Can we just tag, tag on to that? How are we doing it? Um, um, that uh, the issue, raising the idea, not, I mean, it might be hard to, um, to in a concrete way, uh, understand the, these, you know, concepts of eternal life, um, or, you know, even abundant life, maybe, you're, but uh, fear of death, this, that's also unknown, that's very abstract, but uh, I think for many people, especially older people, the people who are going through sicknesses and sufferings, that's a very real concern. So if you address that, then. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that we have to be careful what we promise. Because if you promise healing of cancer and they don't feel like they got it, then that can make things more difficult. Yeah. But yes, absolutely. Anybody else? So you, so you used to be a believer in Soka Gakkai? Yeah. So you say that? So, so what's, what's the faith of the, the Soka Gakkai? Uh, in, in Soka Gakkai, uh, first let me tell you how I got into it. It, it had to do with a Japanese girl, okay? Enough said about that, okay? But it was a period in my life when I'd sort of left my Catholic faith behind and I decided the Catholics really didn't have the clues that they said they had and stuff. But looking back, I can see my childhood faith was really a faith in the church. And when I saw the church was flawed, I left. It wasn't really a faith in Jesus and God. It was more represented by the authority of the church. So I went for a few years dabbling here and dabbling there, got invited to some meetings of the Soka Gakkai, and that was my first really, really good home fellowship meeting experience. <laughs> I didn't know Christians had those, but they had them, and they have sometimes really, really good home fellowships. And you go and you chant together and stuff, and then you eat together, and sometimes they'll bring a teaching and people will give testimonies about all the things they've seen change in their life since they came into the group. There are a lot of and this is challenging for some missionaries. I know it's challenging for a lot of Americans. There are a lot of really good testimonies of answered prayer in Soka Gakkai and some other faiths as well. And we can be little that and say those are real or fake, not real or they're fake or something or they're whatever. But I've experienced it myself. And uh, in every way that you can measure, it's as real as miracles we see in the Christian faith. Uh, the difference is that it's on a very shaky foundation, and the whole theology of why that happens, we won't try to uh, answer today. I have theories, other people have theories. 
Their theories are probably better than mine. Uh, but the basic belief set is the Lotus Sutra is the center. Uh, they are opposed to all use of Buddhist statues and images. So they're really uh, anti other groups. They're kind of the Jehovah's Witnesses of Buddhism. They're very evangelistic focused. They're anti-Christian. They believe that chanting the Lotus Sutra will bring world peace and that you can get your happiness assured. And it will really, it, in a funny way, it helps in a lot of your life probably the exact same way that any good meditation program, a dynamic meditation would. You know, so I chanted 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, a little bit throughout the day here and there. And uh, it was really helpful in a lot of ways, psychologically, I would say, you know. Uh, so uh, basically they believe we're in Mapo, which is the end times of Buddhism that Nichiren Dai Shonen is the real and final uh, main Buddha guy and that the other guys were forerunners and they're important but everything he says supersedes what they say and that he did miracles and things here in Japan. Uh, his miracles are kind of wimpy compared to Jesus but uh, so the focus is all in the Lotus Sutra you get instead of a Buddha statue you put a scroll in your Butsudan that you chant before. So that, that's really shallow but you can google it. <laughs> Uh, anybody else? We got time for one more question. If somebody has one more, okay. Who thinks the Confucianism stuff went too fast? To go too fast, you got it all. Wow, nobody wants the handout. Do you want the handout? But but, could Scaren, could you put the pass some handouts around to people and put the leftover handouts on the back table for whoever wants them? Who would like to say a closing prayer for us? Do we have a prayer, volunteer to close us in prayer? We got you once. We're good. Okay, Carrie, close us in prayer. Okay, Father, thank you that we come here and um, get some enlightenment about the culture and the things that are happening in the world. I pray that you'll help us to be wise and give us more discernment as we go back home to our places of work and church and everything, uh, that you'll give us breakthroughs, Lord, to, um, that you will break through into Japanese people's starts, Lord, and that you will use us in the process. Amen. Thank you. I'd like for everybody to thank Dan uh, with me. Dan, that was a lot of great information, and I am thankful that it's on video and that uh, for future reference.